Welcome to Six Degrees of Wiki, a podcast where two sisters find the six degrees of separation between Wikipedia articles that don't seem to have anything in common. I'm Rosanna. And I'm Nikki. Today we'll fall into a Wikipedia spiral where Rosanna has just six rounds to figure out how the first article could possibly be connected to the last, while learning all sorts of peculiar facts along the way. Let's get started. Last month, we went from Kate Blanchett to the Great Famine of Ireland. Since it's a new month, we're starting a new topic. Round one. Today, we're spiraling from Greek fire to Johannes Vermeer. Ooh. Greek fire was an incendiary weapon used in the Byzantine Empire a very, very long time ago. Basically fire that you couldn't put out. Johannes Vermeer was a Dutch painter who specialized in scenes of middle-class life. Rosanna, do you see anything in common between these two things? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nothing. I can't think of a single thing that would connect those two. Nothing? Mm-mm. Okay. Well, let me tell you more about Greek fire, which I find fascinating. So like I said, it was used by the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire. First developed in 672 AD. It was usually used in naval battles because it could keep burning on water. (gasps) If you've ever seen Game of Thrones, wildfire (laughs) is probably based on Greek fire. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought of. Also, the ingredients are very secret, or they were. So secret that we still don't know what they were. Really? There are some proposals that it may have been a combination of pine resin... Naphtha, quicklime, calcium phosphide, sulfur, or nitre. Any or all of these things, maybe other stuff, we really don't know. In one story, priestesses of Bacchus or Dionysus supposedly dipped fire into the water that didn't extinguish because, quote, it was sulfur mixed with lime. Which sounds pretty incendiary to me, also. And it wasn't even that people couldn't reverse engineer Greek fire. The Bulgarians at one point took a couple of cities in 814. They captured 36 siphons, which is what they used to spray the Greek fire, and quantities of the Greek fire itself. They still couldn't use them, much less reverse engineer them. What? They couldn't even get it to work when they had it. Oh, Oh, that's wild. Yeah. So the name Greek fire was often applied to any incendiary weapon for a long time, including those used by Arabs, Chinese, and Mongols. But a lot of them were different mixtures and not the same formula. Since nobody knew the formula, it was a closely guarded state secret in the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantines used these pressurized nozzles called siphons to spray the liquid onto the enemy like a flamethrower. So pretty terrifying, Uh, I would think. Yeah. It was also called sea fire, Roman fire, war fire, liquid fire, Manufactured fire, and my favorite, sticky fire. I mean, not my favorite because I don't want it touching me, but... No, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So nobody seems to have been able to make Greek fire since at least the 13th century. And my favorite interesting fact about Greek fire is the mystery behind it. It wasn't just the recipe for the fire itself, but the design of the siphon and also special fire boats and special training that people who used it had to get. And all of this stuff was manufactured independently. So nobody, well, somebody obviously knew the whole process, but it was very, very well kept secret. So in the 19th century, there was an Armenian named Kavifian, and he approached the government of the Ottoman Empire saying that he had created a new type of Greek fire, and he wanted to be in charge of its use during naval battles. But he wouldn't tell them what it was, so they'd put him in charge. And strangely, he was poisoned by imperial authorities without ever giving up the secret, if he even had it in the first place. So we still don't know if anyone ever figured it out. Round two. Rosanna, what do you think the next degree is between Greek fire and Johannes Vermeer? Well, nothing really stands out as connecting them. (laughs) You did mention a lot of, like chemicals and painters use chemicals i don't know if they're the same chemicals but there could be a path there (laughs) so based on that 
I'm going to guess sulfur. <laughs> sulfur, all right. Your guess of sulfur is incorrect. The next degree is Bacchus, or Dionysus. He was the god of the grape harvest, winemaking, and wine. He supposedly invented winemaking. Also the god of ritual madness, fertility, religious ecstasy, and he invented Greek theater. Well, he's given the acknowledgement of having invented Greek theater. And the cult of Dionysus, its main religious focus was unrestrained consumption of wine. He's that major, major popular figure from Greek, Greek mythology and religion. Became more important over time also. In some lists, he's included in the Twelve Olympians, the last one. And he's the only god born from a mortal mother. Dionysus is followed by wild female, female followers, they're not quite human, called maenads, and bearded satyrs. He's the one who gave King Midas the gift slash curse of turning everything he touched into gold. And in his youth, there were multiple stories. He kept ending up on ships where the sailors wanted to sell him. He was very beautiful. They wanted to sell him as a slave. And so he would turn into an animal or unleash dangerous animals, and people would jump overboard and turn into dolphins. The people would turn into dolphins. <laughs> okay. Yeah. More than one. It's very odd. It's very strange. Interesting fact about Dionysus. He is represented by city religions as the protector of those who do not belong to conventional society. Oh. Represents the chaotic, dangerous, unexpected, everything that's outside of human reason. And basically things that can only be attributed to the gods because they're unforeseeable. Most worship of Dionysus ended by the year 1000. But there have been some revivals, mostly by college students from the 18th century <laughs> onward. <laughs> but the best one was during Easter in 1282 in Scotland. A parish priest led young women in a dance in honor of Dionysus. A priest, like a Christian priest. He danced and sang at the front of the congregation, carrying a representation of a phallus on a pole. <gasps> that was one of his symbols. Unsurprisingly, he was killed by a Christian mob <gasps> later that year. That's horrible. Round three. Rosanna, what's the next degree between Dionysus and Vermeer? Okay, here's the thing. Okay. So, like, royalty, you know, loves to have their portraits done? Yes. I see where you're going. Mm-hmm. So, my guess is King Midas. King Midas? That's a good guess. Unfortunately, it's incorrect. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> the next degree is religious ecstasy. Yeah, that was not on my list. Um, <laughs> okay. I don't even know what that means. Let me tell you what it means. Religious ecstasy is a reported kind of altered state of consciousness. It means uh, someone has greatly reduced external awareness expanded interior mental and spiritual awareness, usually accompanied by visions or emotional or physical euphoria. Okay. You may have heard of some saints that have experienced religious ecstasy or some mystics. A person's perception of time and space generally disappear during religious ecstasy experiences. Okay. They can forsake any senses or, or any idea of how long they're in this state. And these states are often interpreted as religious ecstasy when they've been deliberately induced with some, yeah, they call them ecstatic practices, um, like with meditation or drugs or fasting or sweating, like sweat lodges. Yeah. You know? Some shamans try to induce ecstasy to travel to heaven or the underworld to guide them into interacting with spirits, to help them with healing or clairvoyance. I mean, that's what they believe it does. Right. You believe what you want. <laughs> An example of religious ecstasy, fire walkers in Greece that dance themselves into this state of ecstasy at an annual festival, and they believe themselves to be under the influence of St. Constantine when they do it. Okay. And one example that I think a lot of people have probably heard of, at least in, in movies, Pentecostal revivals, where ecstasy comes in the form of, here's a list of... of 
things that you can see at these revivals. Squealing, shrieking, an inability to stand or sit, uttering apocalyptic prophecies. Whoa. Holy laughter. I don't know what that is. <laughs> crying and and barking. <laughs> Holy laughter. <laughs> Some people have claimed to have received spontaneous gold tooth fillings during religious ecstasy. I feel like that's one you could check. You yeah, could that's verify the before and after. Or not. Round four. What is the next degree between religious ecstasy and Vermeer? I'm just going to keep on keeping on because. Okay. Maybe one of these times I'll hit on something. <laughs> you said visions. And a lot of artists get their ideas and uh, inspiration from visions that they Mm -hmm. have. So my guess is visions. All right. Your guess of visions is incorrect. Wait, wait, wait. Is it holy laughter? (laughs) It's not. God, I wish it was. (laughs) I wish it were holy laughter. Okay. I really want to know what that is. It was not linked. I could not find more information about holy laughter. Darn it. The next degree is perception of time. Oh, gosh. This sounds like an existential crisis. (laughs) It's actually a lot more complicated than I had realized. I just never really thought much about it. It's a field of study within psychology and cognitive linguistics and neuroscience. So it's just a whole mixed bag yeah and it refers to a subjective experience or sense of time where time is measured by somebody's own perception rather than an objective perception about how long events last i mean you can't directly experience or understand somebody else's perception of time but you can study it scientifically the perception of time isn't associated with a specific sensory system in the human body but they do think that humans have have a system or several complementary systems that govern mm. their time perception. That makes it's sense. It's handled by several parts of the brain, which I didn't write down because they're hard to pronounce. <laughs> so I left them out. One scientist named Carl Ernst von Baer was a pioneer of time perception study, but he focused on how different species experience time, which I thought was really interesting because I yeah. never thought about how... I don't know, a monkey experiences time versus a human. But how could you tell anyway? I have no idea. (laughs) I don't know how you'd study that. I mean, like, well, this monkey looks bored, so he must have thought this much time had passed. (laughs) I don't understand how you could figure that out. There are some temporal illusions related to time perception, like the telescoping effect where people usually recall recent events as occurring further back in time than they actually did, or distant events as occurring more recently than they actually did, which is pretty common. Huh. Strangely, auditory stimuli appears to actually last longer than visual stimuli in most cases. So like listening to a really powerful song may seem like it's, it's longer than seeing something interesting. Okay, I guess... I guess. I'd have to, like, test that. (laughs) Yeah. That's weird. This is interesting. People with anxiety or people in great fear, for some reason, experience greater time dilation in response to the threat stimuli because they have higher levels, I didn't know this, of epinephrine, which increases brain activity. So it's basically an adrenaline rush that makes an event seem to take longer than it actually does. Huh. That's... You know, it makes sense. Another interesting fact, sad fact, but still interesting. Uh, Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, and ADHD, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, have all been linked to abnormalities in dopamine levels in the brain, which causes noticeable impairments in time perception, one way or the other. So people that have ADHD experience time differently than people who don't. Oh, that's that's rough, because it's already difficult. Parkinson's is a really interesting one. There was a case study where they asked people to clap on rhythm. And a man with Parkinson's, which affects your time perception, he started clapping rhythmically, and then he would clap very irregularly. And he got mad because they told him he wasn't clapping at a regular beat, but he thought he was. But it was very irregular. Oh, 
that must be so frustrating. Yeah. Just changes your whole oh, brain. Oh, I can't imagine. Round five. Okay, Rosanna, uh -huh. can you guess the next degree? I wrote down several things that sounded interesting. I'm not exactly sure how to tie them to Vermeer. I wrote down Von Baer, because he okay. sounded cool-ish. <laughs> But also, like, anxiety and ADHD, and I wonder if it seems like artists or – I don't know if artists are more prone to having those things or people that have those things are more prone to be artists, but it seems like there's oh, a connection. Okay. Uh, but you also said neuroscience, which sounded really interesting. Time perception turned out to be way more interesting than you expected, didn't it? Yes. The idea of it is kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> So, I think I'm just going to go with ADHD. Maybe Vermeer had ADHD. Okay. I wonder how they would diagnose that for people that are long dead. I mean, I feel like my guess is wrong now that you said that, so. <laughs> Want to find out? <laughs> yeah. Your guess of ADHD is incorrect, as you suspected. <sighs> the correct answer was in your list, though. The next degree is Carl Ernst von Bayer. Ah! He, know, he, re he really stuck out to me, and I should have just gone with it, but what are you going to do? <laughs> I think he was the only name I mentioned. Carl Ernst von Bayer, or Carl Ernst Ritter von Bayer, Edler von Huthorn. Wow, okay. The Edler, Edler von Huthorn part is his title, oh. because he was of the German nobility. Oh, okay. He lived from 1792 to 1876. He's a Baltic German scientist and explorer. He was a lot of things. He was a naturalist, a biologist, a geologist, a meteorologist, a geographer, and a founding father of embryology. Wow. Yeah. In the 18th century. Embryology. I thought that was pretty cool. He was a major explorer of European Russia and Scandinavia. He is the person who discovered the mammal egg cell. Wow. And based on what I read in this article, I, I can't decide if he was just a big snob or if he was actually really cool. Let me, let me tell you about him. Okay. So he was born to a Baltic German noble family in Estonia. He was a knight by birthright. Here's the story that makes me wonder about him. He was educated okay. at two very prestigious schools and sent to a town called Riga to aid the city after Napoleon's armies had, had laid siege to it. So probably not something very, very fun, being a medical person then. He was uh, trying to help the sick and wounded. And that's when, he re that's when he realized, big air quotes here, that his <laughs> education had been inadequate. And upon his graduation, he notified his father he needed to go abroad to finish his education. So he had to leave helping the sick people of Riga to go get an adequate education. I feel like I might give him the benefit of the doubt, thinking that maybe he thought if he learned more information or better information, that he would be better equipped to help people. But on the other hand, maybe he was just sick of hanging out with sick people. <laughs> <laughs> It To me, it does sound like he was just being a snob, but then he did use that education and he became a professor of zoology in 1821. And in 1826, he was also a professor of anatomy. So he put it to good use, whatever his, his adequate education afterward was. Interesting fact about Carl Ernst von Baer. In the last years of his life, 1867 to 76, he lived in Dorpat. That's where he became a leading critic of Charles Darwin, because he didn't believe in <gasps> natural selection. He's on the wrong side of history in that respect. Round six. Rosanna, last chance this episode. What's the next degree between Carl Ernst von Baer and Johannes Vermeer? I feel like it, it, it must be obvious, but I'm not getting it. <laughs> So then my rando pull it out of the air guess is going to be geographer. That's a weird one to pick. 
Wait, you said that though, right? <laughs> I, I did, yeah. Okay, good. It's okay. one of the things he was. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's my guess. Your guess of geographer is somehow correct. How did you do <gasps> that? <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> oh, I am. That's actually it. How is that possible? <laughs> I have no idea. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank I you am very impressed. much. A geographer is a scholar whose area of study is geography, the study of Earth's natural environment and human society. Okay. So it's a little more in-depth than just geography, specifically. Mm -hmm. Big misconception. Geographers are historically known as people who make maps. But map making is cartography. It's just a subset of geography. Geography is not just about making maps. And geographers don't just study natural environment or human society. They study the reciprocal relationship between those two things. Like, they'll study how the natural environment contributes to human society. How a park may affect urban life. Or the other way around. There are five broad key themes for geographers per the National Geographic Society. Uh, location, place, human-environment interaction, movement, and regions. What's the difference between a location and a place? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so my interesting fact about geographers, which is why I'm amazed that you picked it, there's a very well-known painting by Johannes Vermeer called The Geographer. There is! Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. If I had known that, that guess would have made a lot more sense. Mm-hmm. So this painting and also Vermeer's The Astronomer, um, both of them are thought to represent the growing influence and rise and prominence of scientific inquiry that was happening in Europe when they were painted in 1668 and 1669. Oh. On to Johannes Vermeer. Lived from 1632 to 1675. He was kind of successful during his lifetime, uh, but not very wealthy. He left his wife and children in debt at his death mainly because he didn't produce very much art. Aww. He is particularly renowned for his masterly treatment and use of light in his work. There's some theories that he used a camera obscura, but oh. there's no actual evidence that that's true. If you've ever seen the movie Girl with a Pearl Earring, which I, I highly recommend, it's an excellent movie, Colin Firth plays Vermeer, also Killing Murphy and Scarlett Johansson are in it. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, all you have to do is say Colin Firth, and I'm like, I know. yes, please. <laughs> With a ponytail, it's really weird. Okay, that might be too much. <laughs> <laughs> but still, he's, uh, he's lovely. Vermeer's really famous for using very expensive pigments in his painting. He used uh, ultramarine, lead tin yellow, matter lake, and vermilion. There's no evidence that he apprenticed under any painters at all. And in 1657, he may have actually found a patron. It was local art collector Peter van Rougeven, uh, who lent him some money at one point, too, to just buy his paintings. So Vermeer worked very slowly. He only produced about three paintings a year. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is not yeah. much. Well, he was also an art dealer, which he, and an innkeeper, he inherited those from his father. But I don't think those did very well either. Also, he had... Ten children that lived past infancy, so <gasps> a lot of mouths to feed. What? Sorry, 11 children. Oh, that's so many. His wife gave birth to 15 children, but four died before they were even baptized. Oh my gosh. Interesting fact related to him just not having very much uh, painted to show. Balthazar de Moncoys visited him in 1663 to see some of his work, but Vermeer didn't have anything to show him. He had sold it all. And there was a diplomat and two French clergymen with him. And so they were all sent to Hendrik van Buten, who was a baker who had a couple of Vermeer's paintings as collateral. <laughs> oh my I, gosh. That brings up questions for me. Were they eating so much that he had to give a baker paintings to pay off his... His bread debt? Yes. I think that's exactly what that means. There are more questions than answers in that one. Next week, we're going to learn more about Vermeer's family life and the reason that he lived in obscurity for so long. 
We made it through all six degrees. We went from Greek fire to Dionysus to religious ecstasy to time perception to Carl Ernst von Baer to geographer to Johannes Vermeer. Rosanna, what would you think of the spiral today? I thought the spiral was kind of all over the place. <laughs> it was. I also, like you, love the mythology aspect. So it was super cool to hear about Dionysus. Mm -hmm. And there was some stuff in there that I hadn't heard before. I, I'm still kind of hung up on the holy laughter. So that's going to take a little more investigating. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's just laughter with like, oh, behind it. With maybe? like a chorus of angels behind you while you laugh. Yes. It's time for Cheek of the Week. Our Cheek this week is, well, a couple things. We have a review and a movie recommendation. Our review comes from the Femcyclopedia podcast. Five stars, great randomness. Really great succinct episodes, which twist and turn in ways you don't expect to reveal some great random facts. Love the Elixir of Immortality to Doomsday episode. Really nice chemistry between the two sisters and so easy to listen to. Definitely worth a listen to if you like getting little snippets about loads of subjects. Give it a go. That was really awesome. Thank you. The other half of our Cheek of the Week is a movie review, but a movie I have seen that Rosanna hasn't yet because I don't know what have you been wasting your time on, Rosanna. Apparently not watching To All the Boys I've Loved Before. This movie is so good. It's on Netflix right now. I've already watched it twice. Have you really? I have. It's excellent. I'll give you a quick rundown of the first, I don't know, 15 minutes? Because I don't want to tell you more than that to spoil it. Okay. So there are three sisters living with a dad. The middle sister is the main character. She lives a lot in a fantasy world as far as love is concerned. She has written five letters to boys she's had crushes on over the years and not mailed them, just put them in a box. She has a crush on her older sister's boyfriend. And one day, the letters go out in the mail. <gasps> and all the boys receive the letters. No! One of the boys is her older sister's boyfriend. Oh, no! Another boy is this, like, super hot stud guy in her school, and he comes up to tell her it's never going to happen, and that's when the sister's boyfriend sees her, and she doesn't want to talk to him. She doesn't want him to think that she is in love with him, so she kisses this other guy. <gasps> and then, because of some different factors, they start a fake relationship, and then the movie continues. It's it's a really fun story. It's based on a book, which I haven't read yet. I have it on waitlist at the library. The story's really great. The acting is fantastic. The dialogue is great. The music is amazing. Go watch To All the Boys I've Loved Before. I think you'll really enjoy it. That's our episode. Tune in next time for another Six Degrees of Wiki. You can keep up with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Six Degrees of Wiki. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can support the show by leaving a review, buying Six Degrees of Wiki merch like t-shirts, mugs, and bags, or even by donating directly to the show at sixdegreesofwiki.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye.